John chapter 15, verses 16 through 19. For those of you that prefer to look up instead of look down, we'll have it on the screen for you as well. Let's just bow our heads and let's pray together this morning. Father, we just have a simple prayer this morning, and our prayer is this, that you would light a fire in our hearts to go where you've called us to go. Open up your word to us this morning and teach us what we need to hear, Father, and that you would set fire to something beautiful and something powerful in this church. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Well, I'm so glad you're here this morning, and we're in the middle of a vision series and unveiling our new vision statement as a church at Dresden Community Church, and we are so excited about where God is going to lead this church in the future. I know I've been thinking about this and I've been praying about this for at least a year now, maybe longer, and I believe this. I believe that God has a good plan for this church and a good plan for its future. Do you? How many of you really believe, how many of you thought about this, not just I come to church every Sunday, but that God actually has a plan for this church, and God has a future for this church, and his plan for this church is just like Jeremiah promises, not a plan that is going to harm us, but a plan that is going to prosper us, amen? A plan that's going to give us a hope and a future that God is going to take us somewhere. He is going to show us something. He is going to form this church to be ready for the future that he has ahead of us. And here's the thing. We as a leadership and I as a pastor, we can't do this ourselves. Every one of you needs to believe that as well. So let me ask you one last time. Do you believe that God has a good plan for this church and for its future? I want you to pray about that in the days going forward. I want you to think about it. I want you to let God paint a picture for you of where he wants you to come with us along because this is a whole church vision. This isn't just a pastoral vision. This isn't just a leadership vision. This isn't even just a Sunday morning vision. This is a whole church, whole future vision, and I believe he has incredible things in store for us, and I want you to as well. Now, if you weren't here last week, and especially if you were serving at the Terry Fox Run, we know you had important things to do. We missed you. We really did. But we know you had an important thing to do. What I want you to do is, if you missed last Sunday, I want you to go online. How many of you knew we have recorded sermons online, and you can actually see and not just listen? Every sermon that happens almost here at DCC, you can go online. And I want to challenge you to go back and listen to last week's message, because so much of what we're going to talk about today is going to make more sense if you hear what we talked about last week. So can you do that for me? Can you go back on YouTube? You all know what YouTube is, don't you? Go on our website, click on the YouTube symbol, and you can go and watch it together. Last week, we kicked off our vision series with a bang, those of you who were here, didn't we, so to speak? We kicked it off with a bang, and you're going to understand what that means if you go back and you listen to what happened last week. So if you were here, just a little refresher, we talked about something really important. We talked about this thing called the 3 a.m. test. Do you remember what that is? Here's how it goes. This was a favorite question one of my professors used to ask us in Bible college, and this is what he said. He says, if someone broke into your house at three in the morning, they walked up the stairs, if your bedroom is up the stairs, into your room, and they woke you up from a dead sleep, and they wanted to know, they shook you and said, what is your church all about? What would you say? Jesus, that's good. good. I like the answer, Jesus. I don't dislike that. But I have three words that I want you to use. If someone was to ever do this to you and they were to break into your house and they were to come into your room and from a dead sleep they were to wake you up and they wanted to know what Dresden Community Church is all about, we told you three words last week that were the framework. And if you can't remember it, just look behind me. What are those three words that we want you to remember? Say them for me. That's right. Believe, belong, belong. Come, if you're ever struggling when your neighbor is asking you about this church or your kids are sitting there on a Sunday morning and they don't want to go and they're like, why do we do this anyways? This is what you tell them. We do this because we do this to believe. We do this to belong. And we do this to become. Our entire vision statement is based and built and framed around these three words. And this is what we're talking about these three weeks in a row. And on the next slide, you're going to see our entire vision statement. We're going to keep putting this in front of you because we believe in this as a leadership. And we believe that this is where God is calling us to go. And we believe that this is what God wants us to embody as a church. And this is what it says. Our vision at DCC here is to be a thriving place for you. For who? For you. A thriving place, meaning a place that is full of life, that is fully alive. A thriving place for you to believe in the Lord Jesus, to belong to the family, and to become the follower he has called you to be. A thriving place for you to believe in the Lord Jesus, to belong to the family, this family, and to become the follower he has called you 
to be. Now, I want to talk to you this morning. I want to take us a little further than we went last week, and I want to talk to you about one huge reason why these three words mean so much to me and why they're going to mean so much to us as a church. And it's interesting. Here's the reason why. Because your average person out there, and when I say out there, I mean outside the four walls of this church, your average neighbor, your average friend, your average family member, your average person out there in the world that we live in right now can't think of a single reason why they would want to set foot in here. How many of you knew that? Your average person in the culture that we live in today, here is the honest truth, they can't think of a single reason why they would ever really want on a Sunday morning to get up, get ready, and go to church. And your average person out there can't think of why they would want to set foot in here. I'm not saying this to be disrespectful. I'm saying this from years of experience in my long life as a pastor. And it's this look that they give me when I invite them to church that tells me what's going on. Maybe you've had this experience. When you invite a friend to church, they give you this blank stare. And inside their head, if you could read the box, the text box is happening, this is what it would say. Would you like to come to church with me? Why in the world would I want to do that? Isn't that the truth? Have you ever seen that look before? Have you ever invited someone to church and they look at you and they're not trying to be rude? They're not trying to be disrespectful. They're actually trying to be respectful and kind when they answer you. So whatever answer you get from them, I don't know what it is. But deep down inside, your average person in the world that we live in right now looks at you when you invite them to church and says, well, why in the world would I want to do that? You might as well have invited them to come over to your house into the backyard and polish the leaves on your tree. Would you ever want to do that? Or someone invited you to go and buy an ostrich one day, you would think to yourself, that sounds delightful, but why in the world would I want to do that? Your average person in the world we live in today does not have a single reason out there why they would want to set foot in here. And I want to tell you this because these three words play exactly into that. The word church doesn't mean what it used to mean. Fifty years ago, if somebody's life was falling apart and they wanted to find God, do you know where they went? They went to church. They just knew. If they were looking for advice and they were looking for counsel, they would find the nearest pastor. But in our day and age, the minute you say you're a pastor, people scatter in every direction. And they apologize for all the things that they just said in the last five minutes of your conversation with them. For every single weird, slight, and off-color word. Our world has changed. I'm not saying this to tell you anything you don't already know, but I want to bring your attention to this truth that the average person outside the four walls of this church has no idea why they would want to set foot in here. And this is the reason why I love these three words so much is because each of these three words points to a deep, God-given longing that every human being has. Do you know what I mean? Each of these three words points to a God-given longing that every person knows, that every person feels. Whether you are a Christian or not, you have this ache, you have this longing, you have this desire. And when we speak these powerful biblical words, each one of them is a mini invitation. Because the truth is, whether they want to go to church or not, or whether they know that what they need is inside the four walls of this building or not, every person alive right now knows and has a desire to believe in something. Have you noticed that? Think of all the crazy stuff that people believe these days. Think of all the things they throw themselves into and that they search for. Every human being has a God-given desire and a longing to believe in something. Every human being has a God-given desire and longing to belong somewhere. And every human alive has a deep God-given longing and ache to become something more than they are. If you walk into chapters, those of you who don't know, chapters is a place that sells books, those things, the stacks of paper with the hard covers on top, there's no screens, in case you're wondering, those of you under the age of 18. If you go into chapters, half of the shelves and aisles are dedicated to self-help books that promise you this. In seven days, you can be a new person if only you do this. In seven days, you can have a new family, a new wife, a new husband, a new kid if you just follow this one simple rule, and our whole culture is saturated with different ways to become something more than you are. And I promise you this, that if you open your eyes and if you look around in the world that we live in right now, you will see this truth everywhere, that our culture has deep, God-given needs to believe in something, to belong somewhere, and to become something. And this is why I love these three words. And those of us who know Jesus, we know that the answer to all of these three things we find in Jesus. Amen? Those of us who know Jesus know that the answer to these longings and aches and desires are all found in Jesus, all found inside his family, but those who are on the outside of this church don't. 
And that's why when you speak these three words, that's why when you remember these three words, that's why when you put them on your vehicle, on your Facebook page, you are reminding people, you are inviting people, you are giving them three powerful reasons why they would want to come here because there is a God-given hole inside their heart and it is only found in Jesus. These three words still have currency in our day and age. They still mean something to people when the word church no longer does. Are you with me so far? When I was growing up, we used to watch this show called The Donut Man. Did any of you watch The Donut Man when you were growing up? Maybe a few of you. You're not proud of it, are you? We watched the show called The Donut Man, and it was a show that Christian kids watched because all the non-Christian kids would watch Barney the Purple Dinosaur. That's who they followed. But us Christian kids, we didn't watch Barney. We didn't trust dinosaurs. We watched The Donut Man. And he was this guy who had overalls on and a bowler cap, and he used to do episode after episode. And at the end of every episode, he would use the same illustration, and it was an illustration about a donut. And he would take out a donut, and he would say this. He would say, all of our hearts are like a donut. It's profound, isn't it? Do you feel that? You should be writing this down. This is important information. He would take out a donut and all the children would be gathered around him and he would say, all of our hearts are like a donut. And then he would say, there is a hole in the middle of them. And the only thing that can fill that hole is Jesus. So maybe it's a little more profound than we first thought. All of our hearts are like a donut and there's a hole in the middle of them and the only person that can fill that hole and that can fill that void is Jesus. And if you spend the rest of your life searching and trying every other thing on planet earth and every other experience and every other opportunity, you will find out that nothing will fill that void, nothing will fill that hole until you find Jesus. Now, when I was younger, I never really understood that illustration because all I could think about when he pulled a donut out was how hungry I was. But as I grew older and the, digger, the deeper I dug in the scriptures, the more I realized that this is true, is that inside your heart and mine and everyone you know is a God-shaped hole. And the only person that can fill that hole is Him. Now, Augustine, the early church father, is a famous Christian author and writer and pastor. And this is what he used to say. He used to say, God, our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? Our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. And this is the fundamental truth of the gospel. This is the fundamental truth of Jesus is that your heart and my heart will be restless until the end of our days, until we find rest in him. And so we're not shy here. The thing that you are looking for is Jesus. The thing that I am looking for is Jesus. The thing that your neighbor is looking for is Jesus. And when we use these three words, I want to drill this home for you. Each one of them is an invitation to somebody who doesn't know what the word church means, but they do know what it feels like to want to believe in something. They, doesn't know, they don't know what a pastor is, but they do know what it feels like to want to belong somewhere, and they do know what it feels like to want to become something more. All of these longings are like magnets to iron ore. They are drawing you and pushing you and pulling you towards Jesus. These are God-given longings that point you to Him. Now this morning, I want to talk to you about the second word in our vision statement, and it's the word belong. So open up your Bibles, and we're going to read together. We're going to start a few verses earlier than we got there up on the screen, but we'll get there. John chapter 15, and we're going to go from verses 12 to verse 19. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servant, servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. And that is why the world hates you. Let's stop there. So deep down inside all of us, deep down in the depths of our souls, is a powerful desire and longing to belong somewhere. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
How many of you know what it feels like to be outside of what's happening, to feel distant and disconnected? It's a painful thing. And what that is, is every one of us in the depths of our hearts has a longing to belong somewhere, to fit in somewhere, to have a place to call home. Every one of us has a God-given desire and longing to know and be known and to be accepted and loved and cared for. And whether you recognize it or not, it is true across the board that we all have this longing and desire to belong. And what I want to tell you this morning is that desire that you have is no accident. It's not just a matter of psychology. It is a God-given desire that is in your heart to point you and draw you to Him. And you don't have to look too hard in our society to see it. You don't have to look too hard in your own soul to see it. If you want to know and see what belonging looks like, go walk down the street, hang out at the high school for one hour, and come back and tell me that we don't long to belong. How many of you remember what it's like to be in high school? For some of you, it's a little longer than others, isn't it? If you look and you just watch what happens, you will see this hunger and this desire, almost this fear of not belonging, and you will see it everywhere across the cafeteria, and you'll see this desire to fit in. They did this study years ago. It's a classic study, and it's called the Ash Experiment, and they took a bunch of college students, they put them at a table, and they showed them this chart with two lines on it, or two sides. One side had a line segment, and the other side had three choices, and all you had to do in this experiment was select the right line that corresponded in length to one on the left. Which one on the right was the same length as the one on the left? Does that sound like a simple experiment? It was. It was painfully simple. Every single time the answer was painfully obvious. And so they had no question about it. You knew what the answer was. But here was the trick. Five of the six people sitting at the table were in on the experiment and they were playing a trick on the person at the end. You ever felt like that? Some days at work feel like that, don't they? Five people in front and then one person at the end and they took this poor unsuspecting soul and put them at the end. And each time they would answer out loud along the table which line they thought was the right one. And so you hear them say, one, one. One, one, one. And then the next line would be two, 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 two. And the first few times, everybody answered correctly, but all of a sudden, the first five people, they changed the game, and they started answering wrong. They started answering the line that was very clearly the wrong answer, and everybody knew it. And I had a chance to watch this online, and I'd encourage you to go and do this. You can watch, and the guy on the end is fine. He's calm. He's cool. He's collected until all of a sudden, they start answering two when the answer is clearly one. And all of a sudden, his head perks up, and he starts to kind of look around like this. And then he starts squinting at the board to see if there's something wrong with his vision. And then he looks to the guy that is left. And every single person that answers this question incorrectly, you can see the tension build until he's squirming in his chair and he's moving around. And when it finally gets to him and all the people in the row have answered the wrong answer, all of them have answered one when the answer is two. In his head, he's thinking, I know the answer is two, but when it finally gets to him, what does he say? One. He says one. They did this experiment over and over and over again, and one after another, these people would answer one when the answer was very clearly two. And you could see it in his body language as the answer is he sinks into his chair and he huddles up a little bit and he's like, one. All the other answers are confident and open, and he sinks in and he says, one. One after another. 75% of the people who did this test answered at least once or more times wrongly just because the people beside them did it. 25% of the people did it wrong every single time, and some of you understand that. Do you know why they did it wrong when the other guys did it wrong? Because they wanted to be one of the guys, not that guy, right? They wanted to be one of the group, not that guy over there. They did it because they have a deep, God-given desire to belong. So parents, if your kids ever tell you that peer pressure isn't real, look this up on YouTube. It's called the Ash Experiment, and you can prove to them that it absolutely is. But here's the thing. It's not just kids that experience this. It's not just teens. It's older adults. It's younger adults. It's everywhere in between. Every one of us has this desire and longing to belong. And it's actually not a bad thing. It's there for a very good reason. It is there to draw you and point you to Jesus, to ache until you find him. Now in John 15, there are two incredibly important words that I want to point you to this morning, and here's what they are. The words choose and the word belong. The word choose and the word belong. Verse 16 says something utterly remarkable. Jesus says this. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but what? I chose you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. 
you. I want you to think for a second. I want you to think back to the day that you chose to follow Jesus. Can you think back there? Or the time in your life, the season in your life where you made a decision, or at least it solidified you grew up in a Christian home, but all of a sudden this was the day that you knew. I want you to think back to that moment, if you can remember when that day happened. And in that moment, you probably think to yourself, well, that's the day I chose Jesus. That's the day I chose to follow God. That is the day that I made a decision to follow Him. But listen carefully. What does Jesus say? Does Jesus say you chose Him? Now, Jesus says that He chose you. This is a life-changing realization. If you can understand that it wasn't just you who chose Jesus, but that long before you ever chose him, he chose you. That long before you ever said yes to Jesus, Jesus said yes to you. And it may have felt like you chose him, and in a sense you absolutely did, but even before that, what he wants you to realize in this passage is that he chose you. Just who you are, just how you are, God selected you. In Jesus' day, it was actually usually the disciples who chose their rabbi. Back in his day, if you wanted to follow a rabbi, you studied all these rabbis and you followed them around and you listened to them teach. And as soon as you found one that you thought, this is the person that I want to become like, this is the person I want to follow, you would ask them, may I follow you? And then they would start grilling you and asking you questions and pushing you and testing you to see if you could really do this thing called following this rabbi. But Jesus takes all of that and he pushes it aside and he looks at his disciples and he says, listen to me, you may think that you chose me, but I chose you. And what I want you to realize this morning is that Jesus chose you, just how you are, just who you are. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that an amazing realization that God chose you for who you are? And so often we flip this around because we think that we were searching the world high and low and finally we found Jesus and we chose him, but we realized that long before that he had his eye on us, long before that he had his hand on us, and long before that he had chosen us even from the beginning of the foundations of the world. This will change the way you think about your relationship with Jesus and the connection you have with him once you realize that it was he that chose you. And this is what that means. Because he chose you and because he saved you and because he died on the cross for you, you now belong to him. Are you following? Because Jesus chose you, because he saved you, because he called you, you now belong to him. You are actually one of his people. You are one of his kids. You are one of his family. Paul talks about it like this all the time in the New Testament. He talks about being a slave for Jesus. He talks about being a servant of Jesus. He talks about being bought by the blood of Jesus. And all of this harkens back to the same truth is that God chose you and you belong to him. Jesus goes on to say, you do not belong to the world, but I chose you out of this world. You do not belong to the world because you belong to To him. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt like you were out there in the world, in the work world, or at school, and had this sense that you don't actually quite fit in? You ever felt that feeling before where you were out there in the world and you weren't entirely sure that you fit in the way that everything is set up and the way that everything else is run? That's actually not a bad thing. Do you know why you feel like you don't fit in? Because you don't. You don't. And this is the crux of the longing for desire and for belonging because the mistake that everybody makes is they try to belong to the way that the world is when they were made to belong to Jesus. And when you try to belong to a place that you were never made to belong to, you will never experience the joy and satisfaction of belonging to Jesus. And so this longing gets filled in the wrong way instead of in the right way. You do not belong to the world. You belong to him. So you don't find your belonging in this world. You find your belonging in him. Think about how different your high school experience would be if you had known that. Think about how many mistakes you wouldn't have made if you had known that, that you belong and were made to belong to him. He is your father and you are his son or you are his daughter, sons and daughters of the king. And at our very deepest level, you and I, the truth is we belong to him and we are his. We are his people. We are his sons and daughters. We are his family, the Bible says. We are his priests and his daughters and sons. And what I want you to know this morning is this, is that you belong to God. You belong to God, and there is always a place set at the table with your name on it because it's His table. Does that make sense? There is always a room in the house 
because it's his house. That is where you are always loved, you are always cared for, you are always valued and appreciated and enjoyed. Amen? His house is where you are always, always at home because that is where you belong. And don't let anyone ever tell you any different. You belong to him. And this is a life-altering realization. Now, here's the second truth that falls heels on the first. Because you belong to him, do you know what that means? You belong here. Because you belong to him, you belong here. Do you see that logic? Because you're joined to his family, you're joined to this family. I want you to take a second and look around this room. I know it's awkward in the middle of a sermon. I want you to do it. Take a, take a look around this room. Left and right. Do you know who this is? This is your family. Did you know that? This is actually your family. Because you belong to him, you belong here. And this is where there is always a seat at the table because this is his table. And this is where there is always room in the house because this is his house. And the amazing truth about belonging to Jesus is that you don't just get a father. You get all kinds of brothers and sisters as well. You also get weird aunts and uncles. How many of you have a weird aunt or uncle? You all have a weird Uncle Joe or an Aunt Sally, don't you? We have plenty of those in this church, don't we, church? We have plenty of weird aunts and uncles here and un unusual cousins. When you join the family of God, you don't just get a father. You get brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. You get a whole family to be a part of. And here's the fundamental truth is that when you belong to him, you belong here. It does not matter who you are. It does not matter what has happened. If you belong to him, you belong here. And only when you belong to him and are connected to his family will that need and that ache and that longing that you have deep in your soul ever be fulfilled. And what I want you to walk away with this morning is simply this, is that you belong here. If you are ever wondering the answer to that question, if you're ever floating around aimlessly, if you're ever not sure where home is, I want you to hear me this morning. You belong here, exactly who you are, right here in this space, right here in this family. You will never know who you are until you know whose you are. You will never know who you are until you know whose you are. Mel shared a really cool illustration with me a few months ago. It's something that she listened to one morning, and she likes to tell me those things, and I love it when she does, because there's always something good. And she had this word picture. You know how much I like word pictures, don't you? Don't worry, there's no firearms today. Nobody has to be concerned. Do you know what the word picture was? The word picture was of a luggage tag. Do you guys know what a luggage tag is? It's that tiny little luggage tag that you attach to a piece of luggage and you put it there if your bag gets lost or if you're flying Air Canada when your bag gets lost. So somehow that bag hopefully is going to find its way back to you. Now there are only two pieces of information on the luggage tag and we label things. Parents, we label every piece of our kids' clothing, especially when they go to camp because if you don't label it, they will come back with a whole new wardrobe. And we do this with luggage too because if you don't label it, you will never get this back. So we put these tags on this piece of luggage and it only has two pieces of information on it. Do you remember what it is? Who this bag belongs to and where they're from. That's all that's there on these luggage tags. Who this bag belongs to and where they're from. When we went to the Dominican Republic, Connie made these triple laminated industrial strength zip tied tags that you could not remove with a chainsaw if you tried. Every one of those bags was double tagged and I, never, I still have it on my bag at home because I don't know how to get it off at this point. And it had this information because she was not going to lose a single one of her bags or our bags as a church. And so everywhere those bags went, they went with this simple tag that said who this bag belongs to and where they are from. Who it belongs to and where it's from. What I want to tell you this morning is this is that every one of us has a tag like that. Somewhere in the spiritual realm, I can't tell you where it is and I can't tell you what it looks like, but somewhere in the spiritual realm, every one of us has some sort of a tag like that with just two pieces of information on it, who we belong to and where we're from. It doesn't matter who you are. And here's the thing, what you write in those spaces will determine the course of your life. Does that sound like a big deal? It is. 
What you write in those spaces will determine the course of the rest of your life. It will determine the future of your family. It will determine the future of the plans and hopes and dreams that you have. What you write there will determine the course of your life. And the ultimate question it begins with is this, who do you belong to? So let me ask you this morning, who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? If you are a follower of Jesus, the name that you put in that first space is Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, the name you put in that first space is God. And the name that you write there is His name because you belong to Him. Long since ago in your life, you decided that your life was not your own. Your life did not belong to your wife or to your kids. Your life belonged to Him. So what you write in that very first space is the name of God because you belong to God. And maybe this morning you're sitting there listening and you're realizing that you've never actually, never actually filled in that blank before. Maybe you've never actually made that decision to allow your life and to give your life over to God and to make that decision to belong to Him. And I want to invite you this morning to do that, is to write His name in that blank and to make this decision that my life is not my life, but my life is His and I belong to Him. Now the second blank is a little trickier. The second blank is where we fill in our fixed address, where we fill in where we're from. And if I wanted to send you something, where exactly would I send this? If I wanted to return your bag to you, where exactly would I return this bag to? And here's the thing. In the spiritual world, we live in a world right now where so many people have the first blank filled in, but nothing in the second. Do you know what I mean by that? So many people have decided that they belong to Jesus, but they don't have a permanent spiritual address. They've got the name of God written in there, but there is no place that they call home. There is no church that they are a part of. There is no family of God that they have decided that this is where I'm going to unpack. This is where I'm going to do life. This is where I'm going to connect. Now, we all have different reasons for that. Trust me, I have heard them all. I have heard every single one, and I understand how difficult they are. Some of you people think, I'm so busy, I don't have time to connect with a church, or my kids are always on the go. Where in the world am I going to fit that in? Or I was part of a church once, and something went wrong, and all of a sudden I got hurt, and then I never went back. How many of you have heard that one before? Some of you say, I don't need a church, I have the internet. I bet you there are thousands of millions of people that would say this in North America. I don't actually need a home church. I have the the internet. I am a podrishener. I podcast Sunday mornings. Let me ask you this simple question. Can you belong to the internet? I see some of you teenagers nodding yes, but that's because of your age and nothing else. Can you belong to the internet, church? Can the internet challenge you? Can the internet keep you accountable? Can the internet permanently encourage you? You cannot belong to the internet. That's why internet church is an oxymoron. So many Christians have the first blank filled in, but they left out the second. And we have an epidemic these days of homeless Christians. Christians who belong to Jesus, but they have no place that they call home. Now, the problem with that is, and I like how Charlotte Gamble says this, the problem with that is this, is God has all of these good things that he wants to send you. God has all of this blessing. God has all of these good things in store that he wants to send you, but he can't because you have no address to send it to. God has all of this encouragement and all of this blessing and all of this connection and accountability and truth and joy, all of these things that he wants to send you, but he can't because you have no fixed address. And I want to encourage you this morning that if that's you, if you've decided that you belong to Jesus, but you're not exactly sure where you belong, I want to encourage you to fill in that last blank, to say that this is your church home. Maybe you need to take a step to get connected, and I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe you need to find a place to serve. Maybe you need to make a point of coming out more regularly in your busy schedule in life. Maybe you're on the outskirts, and all you need to do is take a step or two in, or maybe this is going to sound crazy, and I'm going to apologize before I say it, but maybe you just need to show up on time when the service starts. That hurt, didn't it? Just a little bit for some of you. That hurt. I'm not trying to put salt in the wound. I'm not trying to say anything that you don't need to hear this morning, but here's the thing. I had one person in this church tell me about a time they were talking with a friend, and they came one Sunday morning earlier than they normally did, and they walked through the doors, and they shook hands with the greeters, and when they got inside and sat down, they looked to their friend, and they said, who are those people at the front door? 
You know, those people that were shaking hands, and their friend turned to them and says, those are the greeters. They are here every single Sunday. How do you not know that? And he said, I guess guess I've never been here early enough to see them. (laughs) Now, I'm not saying that's the be-all and end-all. I don't know what your next step is, but I want you to hear this invitation this morning is that it is a step. Something that you need to do to step forward and to step in. Maybe you need to fill in that second space in your tag and say, this is my church home. Write 29043 Community Road. That's our address, by the way, for those of you that don't know. This is my invitation to you, is to fill in that second blank, to unpack your bag. Unpack your life. Decide that this is going to be your family. And remember, remember, remember this. You belong to Jesus, and because you belong to Jesus, you belong here. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.